When most people think about nutrition, the first thing that usually comes to mind is calories and the three main macronutrients that provide them, and realistically, that's how it should be. But if you've ever been interested in taking your understanding of what food does to the body a step further, you jumped into the series at the right time, as today we're going to really start going over what are known as micronutrients. These are elements or compounds that you consume in much smaller quantities that do not contribute calorically, but that you'll seriously regret not including, assuming you live long enough to regret not consuming them. But if you feel you're behind in your understanding of nutrition, don't worry, as you'll see today a lot of these things tend to work themselves out, and you're not alone in that feeling. Several major health organizations organizations are just recently recognizing how important our topic for today is. So let's not waste any more time and get back into the true nutrients. Potassium is one of the most abundant minerals in the body, with the overwhelming majority of it found in the body's cells, mostly in muscle cells. Minerals are inorganic elements that are found on the periodic table. They originate from soil and water and work their way up the food chain until we find them in the foods that we eat. Potassium was one of the first minerals to be discovered, isolated in 1807 by British chemist Humphrey Davy. It has since become one of the go-to examples of nutrition beyond calories. Potassium functions as an electrolyte, a particle that carries a charge. Potassium in particular carries a positive charge. Other electrolytes you may be familiar with include sodium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, and phosphorus. They're used for many purposes in the body, including cellular fluid balance and proper function of your nervous and muscular systems. I'll get into more detail about that in a minute. Potassium in particular gets a lot of attention in the athletic world due to the rate at which you can lose it while sweating, and more recently there have been changes to how potassium is presented to the general public. Potassium has had the unique trait of being one of the few micronutrients to consistently appear on the food label for a while, but starting in 2020, potassium was required by the FDA to be included due to the belief that most people were not consuming enough of it. So there's a fair amount of hype surrounding potassium, but what exactly does this mystery mineral do? As previously mentioned, potassium and the other electrolytes play a few roles critical to the survival and optimal function of the human body. The first function worth talking about is its contributions to fluid balance. Roughly 60% of the body's water is intracellular fluid, fluid that is actually within the cells themselves. The rest is called extracellular fluid. Potassium is the main electrolyte in intracellular fluid, and it determines the amount of water inside cells, while its main partner sodium does this with extracellular fluid. When sodium and potassium are out of balance, this can lead to shrinking or swelling of the cells as the water is displaced. Improper fluid balance can lead to dehydration, heart and kidney complications, and inefficiency of muscle response. Potassium is also used for nerve impulses between brain and body, effectively regulating heart function, muscular contraction, reflexes, and hormone release. It works in cooperation with sodium again, helping nerve cells fire when stimulated and helping brain cells communicate with each other via changes in voltage from cell to cell in order to transmit messages. Messages. Potassium in and of itself is shown to lower blood pressure, relaxing the walls of the blood vessels and ridding of excess sodium via urine. High blood pressure is a common contributor to many chronic diseases in the Western world. Many things can contribute to it, including a lack of regular physical activity and overconsumption of sodium. Potassium and sodium seem to have a very love-hate relationship. Anyway, a great number of studies back up this benefit, as well as sufficient potassium intake being consistently shown to lower the risk of a stroke. Potassium is also used to maintain a regular heartbeat. When mineral concentrations are too high or too low, the heart can become dilated or flaccid, altering its rhythm. Abnormal heartbeats cannot effectively pump blood to the brain, muscles, and other vital organs, then those organs don't have the tools they need to do their jobs, starting a catastrophic snowball effect. And past all the fluid, nerve, and blood work, potassium is shown to help prevent osteoporosis by preserving the body's calcium, cutting down on how much of it leaves your body through urine. And lastly, potassium helps train for nutrients into cells and waste out of cells. Now you may be thinking, oh, potassium is so versatile. It can do so many things, but that's the wrong way to think about it. Potassium must do all of these things, otherwise the whole system goes down. So let's make sure your body's getting as much of it as it needs. It's estimated that only about 2% of Americans meet the recommendations for potassium, though most are not necessarily considered deficient. The recommended daily intake for potassium on a 2,000 calorie diet is 3,400 milligrams. There is a higher recommended intake for those with high blood pressure, osteoporosis, kidney stones, and for athletes. Potassium deficiency is called hypokalemia. Roughly 15% of people are estimated to have mild hypokalemia, though severe hypokalemia is pretty uncommon. 
Temporary decreases in potassium are generally not cause for concern. You can sweat out a lot during a workout, but this is why it's important to make sure you eat or drink some not long after. You can lose too much potassium through urine, sweat, or irregular bowel movements or kidney function. Chronic hypokalemia usually occurs alongside other, admittedly rare conditions or with the use of certain medications. These conditions are usually involving blood pressure, the kidneys, or the thyroid and adrenal glands. While the most common cause involving meds is diuretics that are known to contribute to potassium loss. The most common causes in those without conditions are longer-term sicknesses involving vomiting and diarrhea. That and prolonged exercise or sweating without proper replenishment. Symptoms of hypokalemia include fatigue, muscle weakness, muscle cramping, constipation, abnormal heartbeats, difficulty breathing, tingling, numbness, and obviously high blood pressure. Now, too much potassium can be worse than too little. This is referred to as hyperkalemia, and it's reported to affect less than 5% of the general population. It's very uncommon for people to consume too much potassium. However, it is possible to have too much blood potassium if the mineral cannot be properly rid of. This is usually only a concern for those with poor kidney function or chronic kidney diseases, but it has been caused in the past by certain medications, overconsumption of alcohol, heart complications, dehydration, and obviously just overconsumption. The most common symptoms of hyperkalemia are tiredness, nausea, and abnormal heart rate. Potassium levels are measured in millimoles per liter of blood. According to the National Kidney Foundation, a normal concentration is between 3.5 to 5 millimoles per liter. It's considered dangerously high at 6 and dangerously low at 2.5. Now, if you have genuine concerns, go get your blood work done as this will tell you pretty much everything you need to know regarding your electrolytes. Now, the last thing I want to cover is the most reliable sources of potassium. This is one of the micronutrients that you'll find in some amount in pretty much every food you'd encounter, but there are some, both plant and animal, that stand above others in terms of how much. For plants, the majority of the legume-like foods make up the bulk of the most potassium-rich options. This mainly means seeds and nuts, though keep in mind that most of these are very calorically dense. Some good lower-calorie additions are certain greens like spinach and beet greens, lentils and certain beans, and some fruits like avocado, guava, apricot, and the poster child for potassium, the banana. This is a very short list of some of the most potassium-dense plant foods by weight out there, but realistically, most fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, and seeds are a decent source. Moving on to animal foods, the best sources come from the sea, with the absolute most dense foods being more unusual picks like cuttlefish, octopus, and clam, among some more common seafood options like wild-caught salmon, tuna, and anchovies. Realistically, most encounterable seafood options will solidly contribute to your potassium intake, while land meats, on average, offer noticeably less but still a relevant amount. Overall, potassium is not usually one of the nutrients you need to worry about going out of your way to consume, but there are definitely certain situations where it's good to know what packs it. And there we go, another nutrient in the books. Probably the first one covered that is true as can be that you also most likely don't have to worry that much about consuming as long as you eat real food. Potassium may always be overshadowed by its fickle and overdramatic partner sodium, but it's definitely earned its day in the spotlight as one of the most crucial components that keeps your body going. Now, if you enjoyed the video, or at the very least learned a little something, I encourage you to subscribe as I've got plenty more of these on the way. Go ahead and let me know down in the comments what other nutrients you think deserve an entire in-depth breakdown video like this. And remember that all I ask is that you do your own research and advocate for your body. You only get the one.